I work with Dasan Bushman in the Kalahari because uh, I've searched the world for the most nature-connected people. And the reason I've done that is because, um, one, I like contests and I like to see who wins them, you know, but that's not really the reason. <laughs> I, I was studying nature-connected cultures from about 1979. And I was super curious. One simple question that I've been asking since 1979. Why are some cultures incredibly connected to nature? And why are others not? Right? It's my life. It's all I know how to do is answer those two questions. So don't talk to me about anything else. <laughs> um, so you think about that for a minute. <clears throat> Have you ever followed one question for your whole life? And the deeper I push into that question, the more I learn. And it, the question never ceases to, to engage me and continue to grow in, in the infinite ecology of answers that I'm receiving. But you know why I'm asking that question? I'm not asking it for me. I'm asking it for this young man over here, and this young lady over here, and this young lady over here. I'm not asking that question for me. I grew up nature connected. I was blessed. Well, no, I had great, amazing grandmothers. Poland and Ireland, they carried in their bodies understanding of how to connect children to nature. They knew from their old cultural lineages how to do that. They were rural people in their old country, and when they arrived here, they were rural people. And I grew up, you know, running, playing, fishing, you know, gathering things for my grandmother to bake, cook, whatever. I was trained as a naturalist since early boyhood. And I was looking at the other kids around me, and as they aged up, and out of the woods, they literally aged out of the woods at a certain point. You know, there was an age limit ceiling for the children in the forest that played together, you know? And all my friends were going into sports. So I was thinking to myself, that must be what I'm supposed to do next. But in my body, I could feel a conflict. Half of me wanted to do sports. Why? Because my tribe was going that way. That's where my peers were going. That's where I belonged. And the other half of me was saying, Wait, there's more. There's something else supposed to happen with nature somehow, somewhere. There's something. Someone's supposed to fulfill something over here. I can feel it, right? And when I was 19, I went off to university to study lineages of mentoring in traditional cultures because I could see growing up in New Jersey outside of New York City that that was all but extinct from our social behavior. There was no such thing. Nobody even believed it existed. The tracking lineage is also in direct harmony with the neurobiological unfolding of a human being. And that's where I think the most important point is for us today. You know, I'm going to live and die knowing things that the culture that we live in is not ready for. You understand? I've pushed this question far beyond anyone's desire to even think about any of this stuff, mainly because I don't want this to go extinct. The San Bushmen, it turns out, are the grand masters of nature connection. They take this model of mentoring children in nature to the highest level of any people on the planet that I've discovered. And the, the reason I can say that is because they want 100% of the children to have this experience. In a lot of indig indigenous lineages around the world, they look for the children who are predisposed to it and they kind of raise them almost like a separate class within the society. But if they get enough of them in every generation, the culture will regenerate. Whereas the San Bushman, it's 100%. Everybody needs to have this experience. Every child needs to have it. And the reason I believe that that is true is twofold. Number one, the San people are the collective ancestors of all human beings, according to all the DNA evidence now. So they are the closest to the original human beings before westernization. And their bloodline, their DNA, is found in every single race of people around the planet. So for one thing, they represent the collective story of all humanity. I think that's one reason why it's important for us to pay attention to them. The second thing that I think is important to recognize is that the Kalahari is one of the most challenging landscapes to survive in on the planet. And whereas different ecosystems can be very friendly and very easy to interact with, 
a deep nature connection at the highest level may not be necessary for everybody because the land is so friendly and forgiving that it, it gives even if you're not paying as much attention as you need to be or could be. Um, but I think the Kalahari is absolutely unforgiving and the slightest error uh, in judgment and in awareness could cost you your life. There's some of the most relaxed, easygoing people I've ever been with on the planet. I mean, literally, when you're with them in this really quote-unquote hostile ecosystem, they're absolutely in the most open, relaxed, loving, hilarious space you've ever been in. They're just, they make it look so easy, you know, because it is easy for them. And the reason it's so easy for them is because they are so profoundly connected to the natural world from the youngest age that they have everything they need to be in communication with what they need when they need it. You know, and they don't miss anything. They really don't miss anything. They're superb trackers. Everybody in the tribe is an amazing tracker, men, women, children, because they have to be. Um, and I became curious, why is it that this one culture connects everybody to nature so thoroughly and all the rest of the cultures around the world are on a gradation away from that? And I kind of look at it this way. Maybe when our ancestors started to leave Africa, they pulled a wagon of cultural things behind them, right? And as they traveled, pieces fell off the wagon. You know, the further they got, maybe the more stuff they lost. But I'm telling you right now, what's interesting about the deep nature connection research that I'm doing is that uh, you find me a, a person on the planet, doesn't matter where they live, what their si situation is, whether they're urban, suburban, rural, doesn't matter what culture they come from, there is not a human I have met and worked with yet on the planet, and I've worked all over this planet, who does not respond positively to the neurobiological benefits of what I've learned in my research. But most people aren't ready to engage with the research at this level. It's not going to be implemented in my lifetime, I'm sure, and therefore we have to leave it as a legacy. I have to take it and organize it and break it down into categories because it goes for before a human being is born, and it goes till after they die. Tremendous information about parenting, about couples, about you know, love and conflict and conflict prevention. It's all in there. And then it follows a child through early, from birth into early childhood into the teen rite of passage, which is what we're focusing on this weekend, here today. And then it goes into young adulthood, into adulthood, parenthood, grandparenthood, and into the, the late elder stages. And then they have things that they attend to for after people have left the lighted world and gone into the realm where all of us will have to go at the end of our breathing time on this planet. And there's still things that they're doing to attend. So where does this work begin? You know, it begins before birth, before conception, and it goes beyond death. And there are, you know, most environmental education organizations are just trying to figure out how to have a meaningful day for five hours with young children that they may never see again. They're going to get on a bus, show up, and come and go. They're like, that's all I can handle, right? What do you mean before conception to post death? <laughs> We're probably not going to integrate that John here at this center. I spent five years in Washington State training various members of the adult community to come together like an orchestra to literally hold a greater community activity. So yeah, they have kids programs. But those children are not in a program in isolation. When those children come out of program, they bump into elders in the parking lot. And the elders work with them there, you know? And then they, when they grow up to be teens, they can get right into a teen rite of passage. So they're literally tracing these children through life, you know? And I started Wilderness Awareness School in 1983. Um, and, you know, I was just talking to one of the people that I mentored from the age of 15 yesterday. He's 44. He's got children that are 11 and 13. Um, I think the oldest one that I'm working with right now, he's 50. I started with him when he was 15. I've been doing this for a long time. And I'm watching these people grow through life. I'm watching them raise their own children. And I'm watching for nature deficit disorder and symptoms of disconnection in these children in these communities. And what I'm seeing is the opposite. I'm seeing children all over the world who are growing up with full connection attributes, who are profoundly gifted. People think, oh, they're like geniuses, but they're not. What they are is natural. What they are is nature smart, as Richard Lube writes about it. It's lost on modern people. They don't understand how that's possible. Uh, and I can't wait for the culture to catch up. So if I die without leaving this legacy for all of you, especially these young ones, 
then I haven't done the world any favors. I've given my entire life to research, and even though the modern people aren't ready to actually receive it or do anything with it, I still need to leave it, because maybe these young people in the room will actually be able to pick it up and do something with it at a higher level than I was capable of. Because when I started really working with this, and Jake Swamp, the Mohawk elder, came and worked with us, the one who taught us the, the gratitude opening, he said to us, um, you know, this is really starting to take hold, he said, this work. I think there's some hope here. It looks like it's going to do something really good. And he said, we should see the results in about 200 years, he said. <laughs> and he wasn't kidding. The Haudenosaunee people are trained from young age to be statesmen and to be deliberate and to be thoughtful about the impact of their life on other people. And they think in 200-year blocks of time. They don't, they don't hesitate. So that means he told me that my life was to build a foundation for something. Even though I want to put the roof tiles on and put the chair in the living room and sit by the fire, he said, I will not get to nourish from my life's work in my lifetime. He said, you're a foundation builder. And if you think about it, if you look out at the landscape of that we're dealing with right now sociologically, there isn't even a foundation. We have to clear the brush, he said. <laughs> All the children who are not being positively affected by this birthright, as Richard Louv now says, he feels it's a right of humans to have full nature connection, that this is what it means to be healthy and happy as a human being. It should be our birthright. I agree with that. He's moving a resolution at the United Nations level to get that on the books, that every human is entitled to good air, good water, good food, nature connection also, because our nervous system requires it for health and happiness. All the scientists are proving it. It's completely known now in neurobiological circles and occupational therapy circles. This is the truth of the human body. Mainstream people aren't aware of that. They don't understand it yet. It's going to be 20 years before they catch on. I might be too old to do this anymore at that point or too tired of doing it. I want to make sure that I leave a trail of breadcrumbs for people to follow if they want to implement structural changes at the, at the society level. There is no place in my research anywhere on planet Earth where the spread of westernization happened peacefully and willing, willingly by the people who received it. It was always a moment of conquering and destruction of culture. So what we live with is a legacy of disconnection. And what we've done is we've built disconnection into our societal practices at multiple levels. And so we live in a giant disconnective ecology. And the, it is not an accident that it's westernization that's also destroying ecosystems all over the planet and threatening life systems all over the planet. People like the San Bushman don't destroy huge life systems. In fact, they're deeply concerned about life systems and they're really worried about things like global warming because they're aware that the rain patterns are changing. They're aware that the plant communities are changing. They're seeing it in their lifetime, this change in the ecosystems. Not to mention the fact that all the fences have been put up and the animals can no longer migrate and habitat loss and so on. But those people have a deep concern for the earth. If I take a Western child out of New Jersey and drop them into connection modeling, they become deeply committed to caring about the earth. I don't have to tell them that environmentalism is a good idea. It boils up from within them and they become fierce uh, adherence to environmental ethics. They develop what's now labeled for grant applications, responsible environmental behavior. All right? It's not an ideology. That's something that we need to understand. It's literally boiling up from the nervous system, from the deepest place. It is an intrinsic drive towards conservation. It's not an ideology. It doesn't require law. In our modern times, we're so worried about our disconnected neighbors destroying everything that we actually have to implement laws and hope that things like the Environmental Protection Agency can enforce them. But the politics, needless to say, make the whole thing a just giant, jumbled mess. And then all of the people who are working hard for conservation, we all get mad and frustrated and complain to each other in the back room about what's happening. But the change has to happen in the nervous system of humanity. It's not in the laws. It's not in the ideology. Connection modeling. And now you're getting a glimpse into the mad scientist that's standing in front of the room. 
and you're getting a glimpse into the nature of this project that we're putting together. There is something that we're all familiar with in modern times. Let's call it educational modeling. And we might also think about vocational and career skills modeling. And in the world right now, that's a multi-trillion dollar sector. It is absolutely highly leveraged. It's supported financially. It's supported with universities, with all kinds of systems to make sure that it's healthy and happy, right? That system is working really well. Everybody in the room is a product of that system. We have been so completely immersed in it that we are it. We are now carriers of it, and it moves through us to the next generation. It has its own metrics. It has its own processes. Then there's outdoor recreation modeling, which is also related to health and fitness modeling. So we can go outside and use science and vocation uh, and, and education to communicate about nature. We can use outdoor recreation to play in nature, to have activities like kayaking and hiking, mountain biking, whatever it might be. These things move people's relationship to nature. Knowledge about and understanding of nature and recreational activity in nature that makes us feel good, whether it's gardening or walking our dogs or downhill skiing, whatever it is. These two sectors of our world are trillion dollar funded and they're both doing very well. The Bushmen also have education and career and vocation training. They also have recreation, but they have a third model operating in their culture that I've identified, and I call it connection modeling. And in the Western world, we have zero experience with it by and large. There is no investment in it. As a matter of fact, if there's any hope that connection can occur in a school, when there's a, a budget deficit, it's the first thing that goes. Art programs, music programs. Free play is no longer allowed in school. People can't go out and play anymore and climb trees. All the things that could leverage connection are eliminated because they are absolutely, systematically, and whole system-wide undervalued, right? But the connective modeling is what I'm here to record, it's what I'm here to document, and it's what I'm here hoping that enough adopters will pick up pieces of this and leverage them and study them and watch the impact on the children because I already know what's going to happen. I already know what will happen. If you use it, it will work and it will surprise you because even if yourself, you are not connected and didn't come from a connected background like Hassan Bushman, if you use these simple models, they work right before your eyes even though you don't know why they're working and that's because it's talking to our nervous system in a particular way that has a different process, a different set of metrics, a different set of needs, and different outcomes. So you can't use vocational training to get recreational outcomes. You can't use recreational fitness modeling to get educational outcomes. They can dance together and help each other in the same way you can't use connection modeling to get education. You can't use recreation to get connection. These things require different approaches, different processes. And this is what I'm documenting that third quadrant, connection modeling. And what we're doing with this project, it's quite defined. We're just getting the groundwork, which is get the stories out, get the principles out, get them into 20 minute sound bites, put them on video, put them on audio, have them transcribed so that the research team can take it further. And then we'll be looking for sponsorship and, and co-funders to make it into online training media. Um, that way, I think I've done my job and I, I won't go to the, to the grave thinking, oh, I should have told people about what I figured out, <laughs> right? And you know what's interesting about all this stuff? I take no credit for it because I learned it from other cultures who just before the last of the wisdom keepers died out, they managed to get some of this down. And I had the good fortune to be mentored in a traditional lineage, to have cultural lineage in, my, in my, both my parents' family growing up, enough remnants to connect a, a child to nature. And then I also got to be mentored by and befriend traditional indigenous people all over the world, most, many of whom that trained me are now ancestors. So I, I feel a burden that they gifted something to us that they really fully intended to go out to everyone else. So this is what we're doing. Restoring nature connection behavior in humans is not an easy task. I don't know why I signed on to this. <laughs> I have to talk to somebody when I get up to the other side. <laughs> I want my money back.
Amém.